Hello Year 7 and welcome back after what was hopefully a very restful half term. In this half term we're going to continue with our timeline studies of language and literature and we're going to move forward in time to the 19th century and we're going to have a look at the work of Charles Dickens. So your first job is to have a look at the short video, it's about four minutes long, um, that is on YouTube all about Charles Dickens and his life. And whilst you watch the video, you can pause it or you can watch it through and then watch it back again. I would like you to write down five interesting facts about Charles Dickens that you didn't know before. So watch the video via the link. The link is also on your classroom and write down five interesting facts about Charles Dickens that you didn't know before. So Charles Dickens was writing during the Victorian period and the Victorian period is significant because at this time reading um, became much more popular as a pastime and people started to collect books more avidly, more enthusiastically than they may have done in prior generations. This was largely because they were more readily available because um, as technology advanced, printing became cheaper and the publishing of novels therefore became cheaper. So people were able to buy um, more books to have in their house. And there were really five specific kind of groups, genres of novel that people enjoyed reading. So the first one, the first group or genre was called the Silver Fork novel. And these were stories about rich people, because typically um, everybody likes reading about rich people. It's it's the same kind of idea as things like Downton Abbey. People like to watch the lives of the rich and the famous. Um, it's always intrigued all of us because most of us never get to that level. Um, and from looking at the programs like that and from reading books like Silver Fork novels, we probably wouldn't want to get to that level. But so this was one of the types of books that you might find on people's bookshelves in their homes, the Silver Fork novel. The second type of novel that you might find was called the Newgate novel. That was its nickname, the Newgate novel. Um, and Newgate was a prison because people were enthralled by stories about jail, about crime, about the criminal underworld and gruesome murders. Um, and that still remains the same as well, just as the Silver Fork novel is still popular. Newgate novels are popular. Crime fiction, I think I read recently, it's the number one genre of sales on big stores like Amazon. People love crime fiction. They love reading about murders and um, court dramas and so on. So on the bookshelf of a, of a Victorian family, you might find Silver Fork novels. You might find Newgate novels. You would also find, no doubt, gothic novels. Now, we'll have a look at the gothic novel in um, a lesson next week, a lesson or two. But these were one step further than the Newgate novel because they weren't just about crime. They were set um, in bleak locations, in scary places, and they were largely horror stories. So they were not necessarily in the realm of the normal. This is where you would have paranormal um, activities and paranormal events. So the Gothic novel is something that we'll look at uh, next week. As well as that, you would find on a Victorian bookshelf a romantic novel, no doubt. So these were love stories, but what was interesting in the Victorian period was many of the stories that were written in the romance genre featured people who were socially mismatched. Now, by that we mean it would feature somebody of a lower working class who fell in love with somebody from a higher work, uh, higher um, level of social class um, or vice versa. So by this time, the shelves are getting pretty full. Now we get to the final fifth type of Victorian novel, and this was called the social purpose novel. Now, this is where um, Dickens, Charles Dickens features perhaps more than most um, because social purpose novels were stories such as Oliver Twist by Dickens that were written to bring social issues to the notice of the general public. So as, as we went through the 19th century um, and onwards, people started to be much more aware of um, what was happening to their fellow humans. So what kind of lives people were leading. And there were questions, more questions being asked about what was acceptable 
for people's lifestyles and what was okay and what wasn't. So, for example, chimney sweeps and so on. Um, people started asking questions. Is it is it right to send a six year old boy up a chimney um, potentially to his end or so on? So Charles Dickens was particularly interested in the social purpose novel. But what we'll come to see is that his novels incorporated all of the Victorian genres, all of those, Silver Fork, Newgate, Gothic, Romantic and Social Purpose. So Dickens was a kind of jack of all trades, really, and he was an, an expert at bringing together what the people wanted into one place. So your task now is I would like you to make a diagram or an illustration just to remind yourself of the five different types of Victorian novels. So you might come up with a, a little picture for each one and then note down its name and what it was about. As well as being famous for his novels, Dickens is very, very famous because of his language and the way that he used words and grammar to get his points across. Dickens, first and foremost, um, as you'll have seen from the video, was a journalist. So he needed to tell people what was going on. Um, and that meant that his writing was exceptionally, and I mean exceptionally detailed. So he would have long lists of words to describe settings, characters and situations. He would use multiple clauses in a row and we'll look at clauses and what they are. But if I was to tell you that many a time, if you were reading a Dickens novel, you might get to the end of a page before you come across a full stop. That's the kind of level of detail that he went into. He would keep describing and explaining and exploring right the way up until he'd absolutely wrung every last little drop of information out of that scene and then he would put a full stop. Um, Dickens's work was observational, so he wrote about everyday people. He would often use dialect in his writing, so he would write as people spoke. He would um, acknowledge and um, use their own dialect, their own accents in his writing. And his language was also often quite rhythmic. Um, he delivered readings from the 1850s onwards. So often when you're reading Dickens, if you read it aloud, you can hear a real rhythm in the language that he used. So your next task now is I want you to see, looking at that information on this slide, can you identify and then explain any similarities between Dickens and Shakespeare or Chaucer. So there are a couple of things there that you might spot that show a similarity between Dickens and the earlier writers, Shakespeare or Chaucer. Um, have a look through the information. What can you see that they had in common? And just write it down on a bit of paper, ready to show your teacher. This is an extract from Dickens's novel called Bleak House. And this is a really good example of what I was just telling you about the level of detail that Dickens put into his writing. So I'm going to read this through with you and I'll explain any words that you're not sure about. Um, and then we're going to have a look at the features of this writing. So Dickens wrote, fog everywhere, fog up the river where it flows among green aits and meadows, fog down the river where it rolls defiled among the tears of shipping and the waterside pollutions of a great and dirty city. Fog on the Essex marshes, fog on the Kentish heights, fog creeping into the cabooses of collier brigs, fog lying out in the yards and hovering in the rigging of great ships, fog drooping on the gunwales of barges and small boats, fog in the eyes and throats of ancient Greenwich pensioners wheezing by the firesides of their wards. Fog in the stem and bowl of the afternoon pipe of the wrathful skipper down in his close cabin. Fog cruelly pinching the toes and fingers of his shivering little prentice boy on deck. Chance people on the bridges peeping over the parapets into a nether sky of fog, with fog all round them as if they were up in a balloon and hanging in the misty clouds. Hopefully you could hear in that reading some of the rhythm of Dickens's language that I mentioned before. Let's have a look at some of these words then, make sure we know what they all mean. So this is a scene um, being described to us. This is London in the fog, and it's obviously very foggy. 
Um, we can tell that by the repetition of the word fog, which is repeated, I'm going to guess, but you can count, I'd say probably 15 times, but have a look, see how many times he mentions the fog. Um, he tells us that the fog is everywhere, it's up the river, where it flows among green eights and meadows. Now an eight is a little island in the middle of a river, so you know sometimes you get those little bits of land in the middle of water, so that's what an eight is. Um, fog down the river where it rolls defiled among the tears of shipping and the waterside pollutions of a great and dirty city. So this is rolling right the way down um, the river, this fog. Um, when he says the word defiled, um, that kind of means to be uh, changed or damaged in some way. So it kind of changes as it rolls along, but at the same time, it damages what it sees, so it changes what we see. There is fog on the Essex marshes, fog on the Kentish Heights, so these are different um, parts um, of land that you would see. Then he says fog creeping into the cabooses of collier brigs. Now colliers, you probably will know colliers um, is associated with collieries, so coal, coal mining. And a collier brig was a type of ship that would carry in coal, and cabooses are... They're sort of like um, carriages in a, in a way. They're um, little trucks and the cabooses would go to the collier brig and they would remove the coal and take it onto the land. So the fog is creeping around these carriages, creeping around the boat itself. Um, it's lying out on the yards and hovering in the rigging of great ships. Fog drooping on the gunwales of barges and small boats. So the gunwale is the, the name for the side of a boat. Um, it's called that because it used to be where you would rest your guns. But the gunwale is the side of a boat. Fog in the eyes and throats of ancient Greenwich pensioners wheezing by the firesides of their wars, wards. So Greenwich um, is an area um, on the bank of the Thames. And Greenwich was where there were... Um, boatyards, docks, um, and also where uh, the Greenwich pensioners were associated with the Navy. So the Navy um, was located in Greenwich. There were Navy barracks. And the Greenwich pensioners were men who used to be in the Navy, who were now old and ill, and were looked after in hospital at Greenwich. So where it says wheezing by the firesides of their wards, that's the wards that they were living in, that they were sleeping in. So the fog is covering everything and everyone. Um, fog in the stem and bowl of the afternoon pipe of the wrathful skipper. So he's an angry man. This, this skipper, this captain of the boat is angry. And the stem and bowl, the stem is the bit that goes in your mouth and the bowl is the bit where you put the tobacco in a pipe. So think of a, an old school pipe. Um, fog cruelly pinches the toes and fingers of his shivering little prentice boy on deck so prentice you'll see the apostrophe there of a mission that means letters have been taken out and the letters that have been taken out are ap because it stands for an apprentice and an and an apprentice as you will probably know is somebody who is training on the job so if you're an apprentice it means that you are learning the job so that in the future you might be able to do that job yourself um, there are people on the bridges peeping over the parapet, so peeping over the edge of the bridges into the fog. And it's like it's this sky, as if they're in a balloon and hanging in the misty clouds. Dickens was part of a literary movement called realism. And realism means what it sounds like. It was a group of... Um, writers and incorporated all kinds of different texts that were reflective of what was real, of real life. So realism has some key ingredients that we need to look for. Um, so if you want to identify a text or a book that would be would have been part of the realism movement, there are key things that we need to look for. The first thing you need to look for in a piece of realism is everyday situ situations and everyday people. So normal things happening and normal people that we would expect to see on a day to day basis. Um, and there's a word for this called the quotidian and the quotidian means the everyday. So realism and writing that features realism would 
contain everyday situations and everyday people, the quotidian. So if you think about your daily life, you get up at a certain time, you would have breakfast. Breakfast is normally cereal, um, toast, maybe pancakes if you're lucky. You would then get dressed, you would go to school, the bell would go at 25 to and so on. That's the quotidian. That's the every day. Um, you could argue almost that it can be quite boring. It's quite mundane. Um, but the every day is. But in the, in, um, on the other side of the coin, it's reassuring. It's what we know. It's safe. The other thing that you need to look for in realism is what we call verisimilitude. Now, that word literally means um, truth or seeming to be real. So if something has verisimilitude, it means that it seems like it's actually happening. It seems like it's definitely real. You don't question the world that you're reading about. You don't question that character. Um, and to that end, what realistic writers do is they write in minute detail. So like Dickens does, and their writing becomes almost like a voice describing the scene for us. So they tell us absolutely everything and it covers all the senses. So what they can hear, what they can smell, what they can taste, what they can see. It has to feel almost like you're there to be true realism. You've got to be able to picture it and almost feel like you're standing there on the docks with them. That's very similitude. The other thing that you can look for in realism is a, a realistic depiction of the social classes. So what realism does is it explores the reality of social classes. It will talk about and explain and explore the working class, the poor. It will look at the middle classes. It will look at the upper classes. At no point does it try and suggest that those social classes are things of fiction. It will talk about them and write about them to the point where we feel informed and we know a truer picture than we might have had before about what happens in those social classes and how they interact together. So it, it was um, realism was all about exploring the reality of social class. And then the final thing that we can look at today is what we call an omniscient narrator. Now, omniscient literally means all knowing. And if you think about if you were to narrate a story, so if you were to go back and tell somebody about your day, you could incorporate all of the above. You could tell people in absolute minute detail what happened in your day. But the thing that you couldn't give with absolute um, truth and verisimilitude would be you wouldn't be able to explain in your narration what other people had been thinking all day because that's impossible for you to know. Well, for an omniscient narrator, it's not impossible because an omniscient narrator sees everything. So they can describe every minute of every day. They can describe every detail of a scene and they can also describe for us exactly what was going on in the minds of the characters that they're writing about. So we become all knowing as well. And that's part of that verisimilitude. We feel like this is really happening because you can really understand what every character is feeling because we're being told by the narrator. So your final task for the day is to look back um, at the Bleak House extract. And I would like you to see if you can find examples of those first three things. See if you can find examples of the quotidian of the everyday See if you can find examples of verisimilitude, so absolute truth, realism. When does it feel like you're really there? Is there a particular line or um, a particular phrase that makes you feel like you're actually there? And then finally, see if you can spot any different social classes in there, any different people from different levels of society. And once you've found them, if you write them down on a piece of paper and then your teacher will go through those with you. Well done, enjoy and I'll see you next lesson.